I have to go to C7, and I see I'm the fifth position, so I play. Now I'm the, the third position of F7. And that takes a long time to get fluent, but if you can do this, it's very easy to flow on a lot of stuff. Somebody asked me on Discord about a, an exercise where you go down with a Phrygian dominant skill and go up with a diminished skill, because that's pretty much the, the I don't want to say the most used sound in Gypsy Jazz, but it is very, I, I mean, if you hear it, you immediately recognize, okay, this is, uh, this is some serious Gypsy Jazz, and especially in like the Dutch style, Stockel Rosenberg, Paul Schaefer, Moses Rosenberg, that kind of style, this is, sound is very prevalent. And also in my playing, if I want to, I can pretty much fill whole solos with only this sound. And I made a video a long time ago called, uh, what is it called? Like Gypsy Jazz Loops or something. No, it's it's something with flow. I, I don't know what it is called, but it's something flow. It's one of my most watched videos. Uh, it was with a very bad camera and very poor sound, but still got, uh, I don't know, like 160,000 views or something, something ridiculous. And somebody asked about that principle. Now I'm sure he, that person was referring to that video, but I immediately reacted like, you know what, uh, I'll do it again in a stream and an updated version. And updated doesn't mean better, it means it's just more condensed. So what I did is I made a PDF and I want to switch to that PDF. There we go. So if, if you don't know about this principle, it's something that I learned pretty much from Stochelo. Not that he was calling this Phrygian dominant down and diminished up. I just noticed it in his playing. So I often say to people, and my teacher is Stochelo Rosenberg, but uh, some people think it's literally that I sat down with him and he was teaching me stuff, but that's not how it went. Of course, Stochelo really cannot explain in words what he's doing. He can only demonstrate it uh, at the highest level, of course. But even in his demonstration, sometimes it might not be consistent in the sense that if you ask him, can you do it again, then something else might happen. Because if he's not aware of these concepts with the name or... Like, there's there's no there's no barriers around the concept for him, right? If he if I ask him, can you play something on G7, he, one time he might do a Phrygian dominant skill, but the next time it might be an altered skill or it might be something else. So then you might miss something that you wanted to learn initially. But I've seen him play so much and I've transcribed so many solos for the Rosenberg Academy that I was able to distill this specific information. That's what the initial video was about, the original video. And in that video, I just demonstrate examples of this. And then in my first book, the Van Hamer System uh, book one, volume one, I show this principle again, but a uh, little bit more organized. I show like every possible Phrygian dominant skill down uh, in four positions and then the mini skills up. But I never combine them in the way that I did in that original video. But if I start combining them, the result will be random in the sense that there are so many ways that you can connect these two concepts that showing you like the optimal way, there's no point because you need to get fluent with both concepts and then you need to connect them um, like almost randomly or like how do things go in your improv or you just write something down that connects. So what I did is I made a connection that I think is very useful that I would actually use in real life. But remember, it's just one possible connection. So what is a Phrygian dominant skill? A Phrygian dominant skill is a, a mode of the harmonic minor scale. Now, these words that I'm saying here, a mode of the harmonic minor scale, that's not the way I usually talk about um, jazz or about improv, but for the people that want to know. It's a mode from the harmonic minor scale. Which mode is it? Let me see. It's, I think it's the fifth mode. I think it's the fifth mode of the harmonic minor scale. Well, I'm not sure about that. I have to think about it more. But forget about that right now. We're just going to focus on the fingerings because in the end, that's what I'm using. So I'm using pretty much the same fingerings that Stokolo uses or, or Moses or Paulus or Jimmy. Uh, I just added one more. And the way I did it is I took the Van Hamert system, which I call the Van Hamert system, which is just 
uh, a couple of positions per court. That's what it means. That Van Hamert system is just dividing the courts in positions. And for major courts, I have three positions. For minor courts, I have three. And for dominance, I have four. And the Fitchin dominant, as the name says, only works on a dominant scale. So I have four positions. And in the screen, you can see G7. Then I would have the first position, which is with my first finger around the root on the high E string or low E string. And then third position, which is around the third, fifth position, which is around the fifth, and seventh position, which is around the seventh. So G, B, D, F. So that is, in a nutshell, what the Van Hamert system is. It's just positions per chord. Now, the Phrygian dominant scale, as I said, fifth mode of the harmonic minor scale, is this sound. So you need to just learn these fingerings starting from every position. So from the first position, from the third position, from the fifth position, and from the seventh position. Now you, you could of course uh, learn them from every other note that you want, but in practice you're probably not going to use it because you want to start on the chord tone. That, that just sounds best. And that's also what I also every, see every time. Now, if you don't want to start on the chord tone, you could play some lead tones. Let's say you want to don't start on the G, but you're here, you could do something like that. But in the end, you're still with a position. And the PDF that I've written down here, I took that uh, principle. So every time there's a position, but there's a triplet in front of it. So the first bar, on the second beat, we start just this fingering. That's just a skill down, right? Now, I play the fingerings like Stochlo, so I jump here to a second finger. And then here I get a wide position where there's a gap between my first and second finger. If you play this for the first time, you might wonder, you know what, why don't you just play it like this? Three, two, and then just... And that's perfectly fine. If you want to play it like that, that's fine. It also feels easier, probably. The reason I do it like Stoglo is, well, first of all, that's the first way I learned it. But also, if you later on want to expand this skill into what I call the French way, which is like this, there's a bunch of extra chromatic notes in there, then you have to make that jump anyway. I know that's the way that Gonzalo Bergara or um, Adrien Monnier, uh, Bastien Gignot, they will play stuff like that. So then you have to make a jump. So I would say if you learn it, why not jump there? And then if you go up, you play diminished arpeggio. And then you can see that in bar three, there's a diminished arpeggio starting from the B. So the G is just not part of the diminished arpeggio, but usually um, when we play diminished arpeggios inside of this concept, when we're in the first position, we also play the root of the chord. So, and then diminished, we go to the third, and now we, we move our hand to the third position, and we play that skill down. Right, and again here, I'm jumping to my second finger. Just for consistency, it feels the same. And then we're in bar six, and we play diminished arpeggio up. Fifth position. So here also, I don't jump uh, to a wide position, I just stay closed. And now we play diminished up to the seventh position. And then in the seventh position, there is one pull-off uh, slide that I do in bar 11. I play a slide. And then we go up again. And we end again in the first position, the octave higher. So let me play the whole thing with a metronome. And then I'll explain you how to practice this. So I'm just going to go to the top of the document. And then you won't see everything, but... 
Uh, here we go. Let's do metronome not too fast. Let's do tempo 100. And we'll play everything swing. So, one, two, three, four. Oh, yeah, I would turn off actually that beat on beat one that sounds different because that's confusing. Um, this is just an exercise, and there is no real relationship between notes that are on beat one and the click. So, just take four clicks that are the same. Yeah, and also, I want you to say which position you are. So just say one, three, five, seven. One, two, three, four. Three. Five. Seven. One. So, that's how you practice the exercise. But then what you do is you go into cir circle of fourth. So, next key, you go a fourth up, which would be C7. And instead of going in the same order, it's like one, three, five, seven, you go from the lowest possibility on the guitar to the highest. So, for C7, this would be first position, third position, an E, fifth position would be G. Seventh position would be a seven, uh, B flat. So we can see the lowest position for C7 would actually be fifth position. So you play the same fingering for C7, but you start on five. Seven. One. Again. Next key would be F7. Lowest possibility would be first position, but we cannot play it here because then we get open strings. So third position. So you play F7. Three. Five. Seven. The slide. One. Three. We're gonna play three again. So then we go to B flat seven. Lowest possibility would be seven, which is A flat. One. Five. Uh. Seven. Right? That's how you do it with the metronome. It's very challenging to do, because first of all, you need to have these fingerings all memorized. Uh, that might be easier than you think, but still you have to, to memorize four of them. Then you have to also be fluent with uh, the location of the positions per chord. Now, what's the point of all of this? So once you've got this in your fingers, then you start improvising with these sounds on tunes that have dominance. And it can be one dominant where you just uh, play one of them, or it could, could be several dominants in a row. For instance, if we take a tune that everybody knows, like Coquette, that the bridge is a 2 5 one to g And then it's E7 bars A7 now so on that E7 we can play to A7 so you have to make connections so let me demonstrate it let's let's do back and track let's demonstrate that how that would sound and you have to be random about it in the sense that you can start anywhere 
and you can make the connection anywhere. You don't have to connect from E string to E string. If I play E7, and I start, let's say, seventh position, I don't have to go all the way down. I could maybe stop on the A string and then connect to A7 from there. Now, in the beginning, this might be difficult to make those connections, but the more you practice this, you could even make a plan. You could say, okay, I'm going to stop on the A string and find the, the closest diminished up for A7. And then um, next time I'm going to go to the G string and find the connection there. So I've done that a lot. And Stockholm has done it a lot. Maybe not on purpose like this, but just in improv. So let's find Coquette back in track and try that. And you will find your, your preferred ways of doing it. Here we go, Coquette. I won't play anything else, just on the E7, A7. Oh, that's boring. I'll play something else also. Here we go. Like that. So what did I do here? Let's see if I can remember. So I played third position of E7. No, I did fifth. I stopped on the E string, uh, A string, and then went up with diminished. Now I went to third position of A7. But I didn't really even connect on beat one. I, I was too late with the A7. That's fine. As long as you keep playing, you can play too late or too early. Let's take... Um, Let's take another song that has more of these dominants in the row. Let's take rhythm changes. So let's take rhythm changes in B flat. And then uh, the bridge of rhythm changes is four of them in a row. Because rhythm changes has a bridge that goes D7, G7, C7, F7. So on the A parts, we don't have to do anything. But I'll play something. Second A. So that's bit I did there. I started seventh position of D7, and I went to diminished up from the third of G7. I think I went to third position of C7, and then first position of F7. Let's do it again. I'll play a couple of choruses and then...
that's it. So, I know, this is a long road, of course, to, um, to walk because to get fluent with all those um, scales and the Mr. Pedros, you need to see all the connections on the neck. That's, that's more like it, right? I don't really hear the connections. I see the connections because I just know the positions and I connect the positions to one another. If I play on D7, the third position, and I have to go to G7, I can see here the third position and I can see the third position. I just move my hand to the third position if I want to. Or to the first position. I have to go to C7 and I see I'm the fifth position, so I play. Now I'm the, the third position of F7. And that takes a long time to get fluent, but if you can do this, it's very easy to flow on a lot of stuff because these dominant chains, like several dominants in a row, happen all the time. Like think about Sweet to Brown where you have E7 for four bars, A7 for four bars, D7 for four bars. Uh, think about Donna Lee, where you have uh, F7, B flat 7, D flat 7, A flat, right? So it will solve a lot of problems with flowing, I think. If you just get a, a, a hold of this system, it will um, elevate your playing a lot. Now, if you've done that, if you can do that, then you will add altered skills, like for, let's say, um, like G7, thir a third position, this would be the frigid dominant. You can also play altered. Very it's similar, but it's not the same. Or, or you could play uh, A flat minor stuff. So you could go up with diminished, go A flat minor down. So you, you, you add all of these other concepts in between all of this stuff, and then you have endless flowing phrase and dominance that always sound a little bit different because you're just combining the framework of uh, frigid dominant and diminished up with other sounds that work nice on altered sound, maybe like sharp nine. This PDF I will put on my Discord. I will put the this PDF in the announcements channel for free so you can get it. Of course, it's very basic information, and if you have my first book, th this information is in there. Uh, if you have, um, if you watch the other video, it's in there. Maybe you already know it.